Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Tech Talk Travel Collective session. Today's session is all about the consultants of our industry. And we've uh, been blessed to have some wonderful people join us in this session today. And as I introduce them, I'll bring them into frame. And as with the previous uh, collective sessions, the people who have, are attending this, uh, this live stream actually submitted the questions for the agenda. So we'll be going through those uh, talking points that have been uh, suggested. So this is the consultant session, and uh, we're looking very much forward to the conversation moving forward. So starting off, I will add uh, to the conversation uh, Charlotte Lamp Davies. Charlotte is the uh, founder of A Bright Approach. Charlotte, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And following Charlotte, we have Michaela Pappenhoff, who is the founder and managing director of H2C, based here in Dusseldorf, Germany. Michaela, thank you very much for joining us. Great to have you. Hello. And thirdly, we have Mr. Greg Hopkins, who's joining us from the United States. Greg is the partner and senior managing director at ProVision Partners. Greg, wonderful to have you. Thank you for joining. Happy to be here, Andrew. And then we have Mr. Mark Fancourt, who is a, an old stalwart friend of mine. Mark is the co-founder of Travhotech and Testbeds Vegas. And uh, Mark, wonderful to have you here as well. Thank you for joining. Hey, mate. Good, good morning from Las Vegas. Good morning. And finally, Jeremy Rock. Jeremy is the owner of Rock IT Group, also based out of the US. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's great to have you here. Likewise. Thanks, mate. Okay. So as I said, folks, we, we do have the agenda and I'd like to really get this conversation kicking off. The way we've structured the previous calls is, has been all about managing today, uh, looking at tomorrow and then consumer behavior. So if we start with managing today, you know, obviously what we're going through is pretty much unprecedented. And I don't think we necessarily need to repeat all of these typical phrases that everybody's been hearing about. But uh, one thing that I'd like to hear from, from each of you before we start digging into your own points is um, how are you as consultants currently communicating with and supporting your clients given this current situation? And it's, uh, uh, I guess you could say, uncharted territory. Um, obviously, everybody has been affected by this in one way or another. So perhaps, um, Charlotte, let's start with yourself and perhaps you could give us a little bit of insight into how you've managed the dialogue and the conversation with your clients as this whole COVID-19 coronavirus crisis hit us. Yes, um, uh, indeed. Uh, and again, thank you very much for, for, for having me. It's a pleasure to join today. Um, uh, I was in the position uh, that I have for many, many years been, been doing a, a variety of both homeworking and going into an office. So I was uh, relatively well set up, I would say. And thus, I had already, since I set up my own consultancy a couple of years ago, I had already been meeting, if you like, my, uh, my clientele. Uh, on all of these variety of platforms that we are now all coming to terms with. What I have done uh, with some of my clients is I've spent a significant amount of time um, guiding them through what platforms are available and uh, and where we're able to have the, the, the best and most mutually, sort of mutually beneficial conversations. Um, so it's been a little bit trial and error and, and we're still all of us, you know, learning how to actually communicate as well as possible with, without the coming together. Um, one of the things which I'm a real stickler for is that people use cameras. Uh, and this is the closest we are going to get to actually uh, feel together in some shape or form. So I take no prisoners when I go on calls and people either don't have a camera or feel that the hair is sticking out in all sorts of different directions. It, it does these days. We all work from home. We try to do our best. But I try to be quite pragmatic and practical about the kind of advice that I'm giving um, my clients also because they will be having more and more these types of conversations with their clientele. So it's very hands-on and very practical, I would say, certainly initially. And, uh, and we just get together very regularly in order to keep the conversation going. 
Great, great. The good thing, the one thing I did want to mention actually before we also got started was the good thing about today's session is that we have representation from both sides of the pond, if you like, from the United States as well as from here in mainland Europe. Um, and what I'd like to try to get out of the, the session by the end of it is where there may be some definite crossovers and similarities in terms of the approach that we're taking towards how we're dealing with this uh, situation at the moment. Michaela, let's uh, move across to yourself. Yeah, maybe it sounds strange, but we have um, even more communicated over the past couple of weeks with our clients than before. And um, so what we did is um, we luckily last year, end of last year, we switched to um, uh, Office 365. So uh, there was no problem in um, setting up all of these technology, um, necessary technology um, requirements. And um, now we, uh, most of the team is working from the home office, but we still have people working from the office. And um, we actually set up a lot of webinar sessions um, with uh, clients to better understand their point of view. And uh, we also introduced a public webinar to um, uh, educate the industry in terms of um, how to improve their content, for instance. So that's what we did. And then also we talked to clients who reached out to us and said, well, um, can we extend the agreements? Um, some of them, uh, we uh, also agreed that um, we extend agreements free of charge, for instance, and we also swapping or exchanging services where quality checks might not be needed because the hotels are closed, then uh, we offer other services. So that's um, what we did over the past couple of weeks and it's still ongoing. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. And Jeremy, how about yourself? How are you communicating with your clients at the moment and what, what are some of the, the, the main issues that they're perhaps concerned about at the moment? You know, we actually deal with a lot of uh, construction projects Yep. And uh, that's actually been a, a kind of a, an interesting thing. Over here in the United States, we're considered in many instances an essential service. So a lot of the construction's actually been moving forward. But with a, a lot of downtime, I was going out to various sites, etc. That travel's obviously uh, had to be reduced. We've had to, you know, get pretty inventive in terms of what we're doing. The other challenge has been uh, just scheduling of, of resources and, and what's out there. Um, now, shifting to some of our other clients, um, you know, be, being realistic, a lot of them have actually either been laid off or furloughed, and um, others have actually reached out to us. So it's kind of a mixed bag in terms of, um, you know, what's happening within our particular, uh, you know, client structure and, and what's happening. And I'm also getting a lot of feedback from those hotels and entities that are actually still in operation. So we've all obviously started doing a lot of conference calls maxing out all of the um, online sessions, etc. We actually have been extremely busy because it's created so much extra effort to try to, you know, coordinate these things. We are re-coordinating six times over. How do you project when you're going to reopen? How are you going to project when you have an opening date for a hotel? And how does that move into other things? So it's a, uh, we've actually been very, very active in terms of calls, a lot more than what I had thought uh, related to all these projects because time is money um, and funding all these projects and, you know, and, and dealing with finances and things like that have become critical in, in these last number of weeks. But to be real, uh, there's a number of people I know that have, uh, are no longer employed with the entities that we were working with. Mm. It's been difficult. So, yeah. Yeah, of course. Mark, Mark, how about yourself? You obviously with both your our outlets, entities, Trafotech and Testbeds Vegas, each have their own uh, identity in their own right and each work to do their own or to set their own um, agendas. How are you seeing it from your perspective and, and what's what's it like in Vegas? Yeah, well, well what's it like in Vegas? Not good. Um, uh, you know, Las Vegas, obviously, um, is impacted almost like no other because you know the city literally exists for 42 million tourists to come a year come every year and um you know we've sort of got both ends of the spectrum happening here in las vegas some pro some companies have sort of excised a lot of staff a lot of staff um 
thousands and thousands, and then others have sort of done their best to, to try to muddle through. But but beyond the specifics of Las Vegas, I, I tend to concur with, with Jeremy's points. Um, I think there's two sides to the industry at the moment. There's obviously the construction side, and, and some construction, you know, is either well-funded or, or has their funding secured to carry on with the project so that can continue. Uh, the bigger the bigger challenge, I think, is for operational hospitality. But I guess, you know, back to your point about, you know, our two organisations, I mean, we, we probably get the benefit of, of, of I guess, being, you know, a little, gen I mean, generous of, of spirit at the moment, given the situation that the industry's in and, and you know, we're all in it. It's not like... Uh, we sit outside of it in our particular roles as a group here. You know, we're very much in it and um, impacted as well. So, yeah, we just try to be helpful and provide whatever advice and, and understand that in the in the short term uh, there'll be you know a level of impact on on certainly technology projects in general, but but just the the, the sort of energy and, and workforce you know as Jeremy touched on that's available to really do anything. Yeah. Good, good. And finally, Greg, from your perspective, how's, uh, how's the response been from your clients? It's been interesting. It's um, nothing like I would have imagined. It's we're, um, we're actually busier than I thought we would be because um, the smart, um, the groups that are well funded and the groups that are, are, um, are using this time to improve their operations or improve their marketing plans or, or re, um, um, restructuring their, their offering in general have come to us to help to assist them in doing that. And their availability has been great. Um, unlike before where you would call and they were, they were just busy with things going on. So as things slowed down, it gave them time that they've always said if the world would stop, we'd have time to do this. Well, it stopped. So they're having th that time is there and we've been working with them and um, we are doing a lot of projects now where, um, we've altered our payment terms, so we're not taking but we're taking payment in the rears of a project instead of in the beginning of a project. So we're helping them out there. Um, plus, it keeps us busy um, during this time. So uh, um, it's been it's it's been interesting. There's been um, like I said, there's been some some people have been very positive and knowing that now is the time they can improve um, their organization, both our hotel clients and our vendor clients. Um, and there's there's others that are just trying to hang on and they're not going to be and when it does reopen and it does start coming back they're going to they're going to just come back as they were and that's a dangerous thing to go because it's going to be a new world yeah yeah i think it's going to be very much a um, an interesting dynamic when things do start to come back to what we're perhaps somehow used to and how the 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 climate will look all right so let's move across to perhaps now um a question that uh, was submitted by Mark. Um, as a result of the coronavirus situation, what do you each believe will be the pressing needs um, when it comes to technology in our industry? You know, I think as we everyone is realizing the there is going to be a new normal. A lot of us don't even know what that is, but perhaps there may be some assurity in saying that what that might very well be is a contactless type of environment and how much can we support um, physical distancing or social distancing as well as uh, contactless uh, environments and what technology can be applied there. So perhaps, Greg, why don't we start with you on that one? Um, how, how are you seeing or how do you feel that might be managed? Well, first, I think there's going to be two new normals. There's going to be a there's going to be a pre vaccine normal and a post vaccine normal. Um, so the issues with social distancing, the ocean, the issues with hygiene and everything will be very prevalent. Um, in the in the pre-vaccine times. Um, I also think there may be a little bit of an overreaction um, with what's coming on. I don't know, because um, as we know, people are, are very soon to forget. So I, I think that especially once we get to a vaccine, the the things you hear about um, um, having identification that you're that you're immune to, to COVID or you're COVID free or having doctors in the lobbies or, or all these or temperature checks and, and all the privacy issues that goes with that is going to is, is going to be something that's there. But I do think that the result of this is the naysayers previously about contactless um, experiences or the ability to have a contactless experience where you can you can check in on your phone, pick your room, get your mobile key, 
um, and go. I think those technologies will move forward because that value is, is there's a new value to those types of technologies that weren't there before. Um, so I kind of see that as, as something that may come as a result for this. And I, I, I it, it just may be me. I think a lot of the, the, you know, the chief hygiene officer thing you hear about and that that goes on and the cleanliness. I mean, heck, I thought the rooms were clean before. Um, yeah. So this whole new level of cleanliness um, will be something that that fades away, I think, as it as we move um, into the new normal. But the whole um, I think it'll be a boom for vendors that have a way for a guest if they choose to be contactless will be there. But I don't think the complete contactless experience will ever go away in hospitality. Hmm. Great. Michaela, how about yourself? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Europe, Middle East, um, our clients are mostly based there, so it's a little bit different. We, um, um, I think the hotels, the hotel chains, the smaller hotel chains now really understand that they need to improve their direct sales, uh, especially on their website. And that's um, where it comes to um, uh, dedicating time and, and efforts and also some money to improve their, uh, their website experience and also their technology that serves the internet booking engine. And, um, and also investments into CRM, for instance, to better understand how PMS, CRS, CRM and revenue management systems all work together. So this is, is very important for our region here as well as loyalty because uh, personalization is one key factor and uh, especially also city specific information is important for the first domestic travelers that come back because federal states and local authorities are uh, have often often different regulations and of course we all know budgets are tight in 2020 so um we uh, i think the most of the hotels they start to research technology now this is not uh, costly and they do that internally and they might need help from uh, consultants yes but um, they won't spend won't be able to spend that much money on it so uh, we have even talked to uh, clients who said uh, we will be doing an rfp in 2021 but this year is really dedicated to internal research. Okay, great. Are you are you finding? And this is a question to everybody: uh, Are you finding your customers coming to or your clients coming to you, asking, "Is this perhaps the right time for us to con con uh, consider replacing our technology?" Um, given that we have empty hotels, Charlotte, you're nodding your head. Is that something yeah. you're hearing? I'm, I'm sort of nodding my head in. You're on mute, darling. Oh, am, am I on mute? No, 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 it's okay. I can hear you. Um, oh. Okay. Um, I, I predominantly work with, um, with, with the travel tech organization. So it's really what I hear is what their customers come and say to them. And I think one of the things that we talk quite a lot about is that uh, the vendors, whether you are selling a product or a technology service, you need to be at the forefront of understanding exactly where your customers are right now. Not only do you need to be very productive and you need to be very persistent in your service to them, but you need to also be the one that gives that kind of guidance. You act as a consultant at this particular point in time to actually say, okay, we've had these things in the backlog. We've spoken about when we had a bit more time. We've spoken about already that you wanted to enhance, back to Michaela's point, you wanted to improve things already in your technology you will not make it over the other line unless we start now. And then you have that collaboration where also the vendor needs to be very understanding that cash, indeed cash flow is tight. But I am def I know from some of my vendors, I see that their customers, the, the TMCs that they work with or the tour operators or the travel agents that are, that are in their portfolio, they are, they are asking for uh, uh, the, the, the vendors to, to help them to understand you know, where they ought to put their efforts and what research they need to do in and around which technologies uh, they need to implement. As for the hoteliers, um, I think Greg is spot on. I, I ditto exactly what Greg said. He just said it better than I could because I don't work directly with hoteliers so much. But I think anything that's a seamless, touchless, anything like that, that's kind of automated, 
those ones that have already got that partly implemented or implemented, they are going to be the winners. There can be no doubt about it in the short term. And then we'll see if the others come over on the other side. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting as well to see for those that don't have it, how quickly they'll be able to implement that technology into their existing tech stack. And perhaps those that are running on an older base will find the challenges um, around that. Let's move across to the, to the other side of the pond. Uh, Jeremy, what about yourself? Are you seeing uh, a situation where hotels might be considering a, uh, a tech re re restack or a replacement of? You know, that question is often asked. I think the biggest thing that I always see is um, <clears throat> it's a question of funds in a lot of instances. The other side of it is that it's not as easily done as everybody thinks. Exactly. You, you know, you've got to schedule this stuff. What are the resources of all the solution providers right now? They've been hit hard as well. A lot of them have had to furlough or retrench, et cetera. So this question of actually putting uh, you know, new tech in right now has to be well thought out. What tech are you putting in? And, and how's that actually gonna help you down the road? Because we've got a very different playing field going forward. So you gotta be very careful about how you're doing that. A lot of the key decision makers are so busy trying to run around and, and manage things right now. We deal with a lot of independents, a lot of brands as well, but um, the, the issue there is primarily funding. And what people haven't realized or, or, or haven't really highlighted is the fact that the banks have constraint, put constraints on all loans and lending the, the ramifications of that are, are dramatic. It's across all fronts. They're even reevaluating loans that are existing now. So to fund these things, to get the right approach, to think about it. If you're planning a renovation, I mean, this is the time, really. You know, but I think if you start to look at what the actual reality is, uh, it takes a lot of forethought. You've got to think about these things. And people right now are just struggling to make sure they either got payroll or getting things done. You're looking at occupancies of either single digits or maybe up to 15% of those hotels that are open and the rest of them are shuttered. So it's the challenge. It's, it's always whenever you want to invest, you don't have the cash flow to do it, right? So um, you, you, you're more caused to be a bit more conservative in these instances than not, right? Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing. But I mean, I think everybody's just trying to do the best they can right now. I do think it's going to be a good time to, to uh, reassess your technology. And more importantly, coming out of this, uh, to everyone's point, the contactless, uh, you know, aspect of things and, and how you come through it and what technology you need to, uh, you know, reinvest in, for, you know, that's an absolute need is a critical, uh, a critical focus right now. Mm. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, Mark, moving across to yourself, how, how are you approaching this scenario now from a business perspective in relation to your industry relationships? Well, I think, you know, I think your industry relationships continue on. And, and uh, I mean, I do have to say that, unfortunately, uh, you know, I know quite a few people who, who are no longer um, currently engaged in the industry as a result. Um, and, you know, naturally because of that, uh, you know, you, you te I think one of the things I've found is you tend to have a lot more dialogue. And I think Greg touched on this before, people have a bit more time. Um, so I'm finding that, uh, you know, on a global basis, you know, a lot more connecting with people because they've actually got some spare time to reconnect. And naturally through that comes discussion of, of the situation because everyone's in, you know, as, as some of the, uh, the taglines go. But I was just going to touch on, uh, on the, the last point too. You know, I think, I mean, agreeing with what everyone had to say, I think, you know, when it comes to the large driver of what's going on in technology in our industry, that is being guest driven anyway, you know, as a result of consumer tech and everything they see and read. And I think moving forwards, you know, one of the things that we're hearing a lot in, in, in media at the moment for our industry is cleaning tech and, and um, you know, the, 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 the additional, which, you know, as I said, I agree with Greg, I think, I think at any reasonable standard of hospitality, our industry has been very good at, um, you know, cleaning and hygiene. It's, it certainly underpins what we do in our industry, but naturally Actually, like, people are a bit concerned, you know, it pays to talk about it. But going back to his point, I think there may be a bit of hedging on finding out just exactly how the customer does feel about that. Um, which might drive some investment, but you know, I also tend to agree. I think that at some point, we we have to go back to some sort of a normal or 
normal sort of approach to life and, and, and everything we do, including travel. And um, I think we might see that things are perhaps not quite as extreme as it seems at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll see, you know, it's uh, yep. certainly a lot of talk about it at the moment. I think the other thing too is one of the things we've been questioning is, you know, what's our role going to be as an industry in terms of keeping information on hand about status uh, more than anything? And, and does that, you know, could that possibly mean that if we're keeping health information in our industry, which is not something we've done in the past, you know, what does that mean for our systems and industry? What does that mean for compliance? Does it expose us to things like you know, health data regulations and HIPAA and things like that? Um, so we'll see. I mean, that, that hasn't really been delved into deeply yet, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. Mm. I think a lot of, uh, especially around the health piece, it's going to have to do with a lot of how much people are going to be willing to share their health data publicly as well. So that's another component. Okay, look, moving up right along. Uh, Jeremy, you mentioned earlier um, about systems and, and um, one of your questions here, I think is a good one, and that's the potential renegotiation of existing system contracts. So obviously with the hotels that have been shut or, or um, running on a very low occupancy, what can be done to either restructure or renegotiate some of the existing contracts that they uh, either have uh, on a monthly OPEX cost or affected or that are affecting ongoing support. So even though the hotels are closed, they are still obviously responsible for their monthly charges that are, are owed by contract. Now, some of the vendors that we spoke to last week are saying that they're you know, giving them a, um, a, a break cause period, if you like, where they can say for three or four or five, six months, um, there's no uh, charges on fees or um, support fees being charged. But obviously that's not possible for every option here. So um, I'd, I'd, let's start with you, Jeremy, given this is your question. I think it's an interesting one. What, what What's your thoughts around this? Well, I'm kind of a nuts and bolts guy and I kind of look at what can we do now as opposed to what everybody's talking about trying to, you know, uh, predict the future, right? What we can do right now is stop some of the hemorrhaging. Uh, and uh, I think one of the, uh, the issues that I sort of see is, you know, how can we go back to a lot of our providers? And I'm not just talking about the system application providers because they've actually been great some of them are actually offering three months free things like that start to look at your circuits your telecommunications start to look at you know all of your uh, tv service there are programs out there right now where they will delay things or they will reduce it based on your occupancy and things like that right because what's concerning you know ownership and what's concerning a lot of the management companies is the fact that you know, we talk about all new tech. These guys are just trying to pay the bills and they're on the hook for all this stuff. If you can renegotiate a contract so you pay them at the back end, to Greg's point, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like we're all in this together, right? They realize it. They know it. They don't want to see you fail because they don't get anything in the end, right? So cell phone companies even, all these guys, go back, see what you can do. The challenge that I, that I think you have is that a lot of the hotels, if they've been shuttered or closed or running at, at low occupancy, are running on the smell of an oil rag, basically, right? So essentially, it's it's down to some key critical people. They don't have time to do this, but it's a lot of money because we don't know when they're going to open up again, right? So I think the key thing that I sort of look at is, you know, I know that there's a lot of focus on what are we going to do when we come out, how to market this, how to do that, what can we what stop can we do to stop the people right now, and I think that comes back to focusing on those areas, right? Yeah, agreed. And um, Michaela and Charlotte, from your perspective, in on this side of the the pond again on Europe, what what, what are you hearing in terms of uh, uh, renegotiation of contracts? Is there um, a sense that it's it's in favour of the hotel operator, or how how, do, how are you seeing it? Yes, I think we. Um, I mean, first of all, as we also provide a product, uh, some of the hotel chains reached out to us immediately asking for a contract extension. Of course, we agreed to that. But then we see that um, the government um, in, uh, in Germany, for instance, has um, released a, um, uh, a law of, uh, that um, the, the rent can be postponed for three to six months. So, um, but it, of course, it has to be paid back. But that's, uh, of course, of great help for this difficult period of time. 
And, um, and then I think um, we uh, see a lot of our clients, they are very well organized when it comes to reaching out to the vendors. And we talked to a lot of clients who reached out to all of the vendors and forced agreements for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I did know that very much what Jeremy was saying in the round from a vendor's perspective, which is what I what I represent on this particular call, I guess. Um, we are definitely being asked, um, a lot of clients of my vendors are, are asking for uh, some level of negotiation and understanding um, around payments. I mean, I, I do try to tell my vendors that uh, it's very, very important right now to, to help as much as possible and to be very understanding of everybody's situation. And then we're back to this, we're all in it together. However, no one can, of course, act as bank for everybody else. So it is about finding out uh, a balance on, um, uh, on those issues. But I certainly know that the vendors that I work with, uh, they're all giving an awful lot back because they they see it as in, we need to help our clients over this line in order for us to have a business going forward. And back to Jeremy's point, go out and negotiate everything at the moment. I do it personally, and I suggest that most of my um, clients, they go and do exactly the same, whether it's telecoms or office rent or space, everything. Just, just go for it. There's absolutely no point in not asking uh, because it's in everybody's interest that we get through this. Absolutely. Okay, let's keep moving through the, the items. There's um, some really good points in here that I'd still like to cover. Um, Andrew, can I bring up one thing? Sorry, yes, please, go ahead. I'm just, I, I mean, it's, I totally agree it's important that they everyone tries to negotiate with vendors that they can. Um, and I think a lot of newer technologies may have a little bit of an advantage that, because they don't have the overhead or the legacy where they may be able to, to replace an existing solution with their newer solution that may cost less. But I think a thing that people often overlook are the vendors themselves and that they're struggling through these times too, because they've had revenues go from good to very to bad because understandably, because the hotels pay, but there's not a lot of representation in the governments that I've, I've heard of uh, for the vendors themselves. So they're gonna struggle. And we know that the, the this industry is not gonna survive without the vendors, the technology vendors behind them. And it's gonna, and 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 I, I pray there's none, but there may be, there, there'll probably be a, a good number of vendors that just don't come out on the other side of this because of these, because of these times, because um, if the hotel can't pay them, and the vendors can't pay their employees, and then and, and where do they where do they go from there? So um, this isn't like we're dealing with the big companies. You know, th there are a lot of big companies involved. There's a lot of small companies that that live month to month that are providing great technologies for hoteliers. And it's not like you can just say I'm, I can't pay you now. Well, they've got people to pay too. And um, because it, it's not like I said, there's, it's not like we're, we're dealing with the with the, everyone's not dealing with Google or everyone's not dealing with Amazon um, in the world. They're dealing with they're dealing with they're dealing with with Bob's auto with auto keys, you know, and he does a good job with what he's doing. But Bob's not going to be around hmm. if, uh, if there if there's not a way for them to get paid because they're not getting the same sort of support. I feel from the governments that are out there because the 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 the, the, the travel associations are saying, yeah, let's fund the airlines, let's fund the hotels, let's fund. But the vendors, you don't hear them. You don't hear them getting those checks. They're just kind of grouped in with small mm -hmm. business, and we, yeah. we know what the the rat race is for them to get funds from governments. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Greg. You make a very, very good point there. And and I think, um, as unfortunate as it sounds, or it might be, that we will lose some very good vendors out in the marketplace because of this. And I'm not sure how it is in the United States, but here in in Germany, where I'm located. Um, the government has opened up um, these programs whereby based on the size of your company, you can apply for you know, certain funding from the, the government to help you through these periods. But at the end of the day, as helpful as it is, it's not going to save your business if you're already struggling. It's only going to keep you afloat probably for two or three months. Um, nope. Michaela, I'm sure you're aware of, of what I'm talking about. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah. So I, 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 do they have a similar program going on in the States as well, where, where they're offering? They do. 
They do, but the money keeps running out. I mean, they keep they keep off offering trillions of dollars, and every and they have hundreds of millions of thousands of people that are applying, and the money runs out when when you get your and you have to be. It, it's a very autonomous process that you go with where you fill out your application. You don't hear from anyone, and then you'll get a request for something. Fortunately, we, we Provision has received some, um, which is which is which is helpful as as a small business. But that was that was just recently. You know, the interesting thing is, too, is we've picked up a couple of clients asking us to do due diligence on companies. So there are investment groups out there that are um, being a little wolf uh, right now, if you will, saying that, well, who do you think is not going to survive? And are they worth maybe picking up when this thing comes back together? So uh, we've, we've started to do some work with them, um, with some vendors, with some vendors on that. Yeah, yeah. And it leads actually perfectly, Jeremy, into your your next uh, point that you submitted, and that is during the reopening of the hotels and its impact of systems and technology, given the fact that so many hotels are full allowing staff or laid off staff, um, they're going to need to have to have their system providers to assist in bringing their hotels back online when they do open. But then again, vendors themselves are also letting off staff and, and they may not also be available. So um, given that the many of the system providers themselves have reduced that, it's important that hotels, I think, also work on putting together strategic reopening plans that address their specific system needs and requirements. And um, perhaps, uh, Mark, you might be able to talk to this point as well, because, you know, it's we say we're in this together now, but we're also going to be in this together when we come out of it. And I think that shouldn't be forgotten. Well, no, I mean, it's true. And, and I think going back to Greg's point too, which I, which I also concur with, you know, everyone has had to make sacrifices and, and when demand comes back, uh, there, there probably won't be the same amount of people to meet the demand. And I think the other thing um, to Jeremy's question is that, um, well, number one, you would like to think that well, the smart play is to obviously bring back the people that are furloughed because they know your business, they know your systems, but of course that's dependent on how long people can hold out individually. I think the other challenge around that is that, you know, it's the, it's the timing issue. And, you know, it's not, it, 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 it's unlikely from, from everything that we're, we're reading and hearing that when properties reopen, they're reopening at full scale. Um, you know, we might find, you know, floors shut out here, here in Las Vegas. For example, MGM has said that, you know, out of their um, 10 or 11 casinos on Las Vegas Boulevard, they'll only start with two. So I think um, the, the challenge will be, well, how do you, you know, re-educate? How do you make sure that you get your team a level of exposure depending on how long this goes on? Uh, and yet still stagger your opening while you're having travel demand come back and revenue come back and staff come back, you know, in line with what's going on in the operation. So I think it's going to be quite challenging unless people are able to re-secure their previous per personnel. And will it be the same staff? I mean, this you, you, you basically, you have a bunch of free agents now, right? People can go where they want to go. So will the stronger companies... Um, pick up the top talent from other companies of people who were furloughed when it does come back and how long does it take? I mean, when people let go, when, when, when people have go of their entire sales and marketing teams um, until, and, and, and when they come back, well, what's the guarantee that that salesperson is going to come back to your company or will he be recruited away to another company? And then if it takes, let's say 90 days to, for a salesperson to be producing at a, at a normal level, I mean, that's another 90 days into the into the comeback, even to to, to be to be effective during those times. So I, 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 you sit there and you wonder when you hear some great talent from great organizations has been furloughed or laid off. Uh, is there are there guarantees that you're going to get that guy? You're going to get that guy back? Or is that is that senior VP that was working for Marriott now going to come back and work for Hilton during yeah. that time? And yep. it's the whole culture which is going to change. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's let's change the, the let's flip it a bit here. Now we have a question actually coming in from one of our audience members, um, Peter Sattler, who is a um, actually a lecturer at one of the German hotel schools here. His question is, and I think it's a good one, perhaps for for, for Jeremy or Mark. Uh, will hotel companies change their portfolio 
uh, because of the corona crisis into a more ownership real estate model or will they uh, perhaps structure or stay within a, a franchise model do you see the do you, do, you see, do you see that mix uh, being changed at all or is there any discussion around that well, I think, you know, um, it's actually a very, very good question because it isn't the first time that I've seen some of the, the, the larger publicly traded uh, entities, et cetera, you know, maybe ditch some of their lower performing properties and move into something else. Right. And so that's that's actually one side of it is, is um, you know, you've invested all this money. Uh, the unfortunate part about uh, the way that a lot of the hotels are financed is that they, some, some people will just walk away. Right and then take their dollars and move it into something else. But I think a lot of it has to do with, with um, you know, when are we going to come out of this and, and what's it going to look like? So, for example, the, some of the hotels that are affected now are the large meeting space, uh, you know, uh, hotels, the big boxes, right? And meetings are going to take potentially a little while to regroup because they take so long to organize. And, and um, those hotels could be had at a discount right now because um to fill a big box hotel and pay pay the expenses on that is not easy so i think you're going to see um some changes for sure in the real estate there's going to be some bargain pickups uh you know and the question is who has the money to do it right and and um so i i think certainly the trading of assets is going to be something that comes out of this uh for sure okay great yeah i mean you'd have to think that um you know, they'll be, they'll be um, once we get out of the uh, coronavirus situation, are you hearing anything from your clients or what, if anything, are you hearing from your clients and peers regarding general industry plans for their technology uh, post coronavirus? Uh, Charlotte, let's start with you. Any, are you hearing anything that they may be planning? Well, I think everything is, is definitely going through a bit of an overhaul as well. And then I think, um, a, a lot of clients are narrowing the field down, you know, again, it is at the moment, it is a critical situation for everyone, cash flow, lots of people laid off or furloughed or whatever, wherever we might be. So uh, in actual fact, most of the vendors that I happen to work with, they've not had to lay off many people. So it seems that the wheels are still in motion, but let's go back to a point that Greg men mentioned earlier, yeah. vendors, vendors are, are not um, being being sort of are really not being put in focus but what i what i suggest all the time is that if you're out there and your customers are renegotiating uh you know your the contract with you they need to be they need to be very strong around actually uh, explaining back to the customers their own predicaments and and i and i have heard some some very encouraging story where the partnership, uh, you know, is working out because both is trying to help each other over on the other side. But this is more from an SME perspective. And so these are also very, I'm not saying that the larger vendors don't have those very personal relationships with their customers, but certainly my vendor, vendors who are sort of more SMEs, they very much have that very personal relationship. And, and again, uh, they are focusing in on, uh, on the back end of the vendors, they're focusing in on improving the various products that they sell on to their vendors and making it an even better product now that they have an opportunity to get through their own backlog, rather than have a lot of new sales coming in that they then, that always ends up going to the front of the queue. So I think uh, the, the customers of my vendors, they are looking at how to, uh, make as much money as uh, if you're under the circumstances and asking the vendors, you know, to kind of help them continuously to improve slightly better products for them. So that's really where, where we are landing at the moment, I would say. Okay. And Michaela, what about yourself? Before we move across to the US side, are you, what are you hearing from your clients in relation to any technology post coronavirus? Um, we are, when we talk to clients, we, um, we actually hear a lot that they are going to review their current um, technology infrastructure completely. So, uh, and this is not only in the German speaking markets, this is uh, Europe and um, Middle East and, um, and Israel as well. So um, they are really um, proving what is, is there today and then um, would like to find out if they really have got the technology they need in order to um, to work with the systems, so um, 
and and then um, we also get feedback that they need help with um, some guidelines they uh, they need to put together. So um, I, I mentioned that earlier. We have a lot of new standards now, and they and I think Marriott is working on hygiene standards. Accor is working on standards, but then the smaller uh, regional hotel chains, which we have a lot in our region, um, they need guidelines as well. And then who provides this? And this seems to be uh, uh, an industry topic that is nobody is looking at at the moment for those um, hotels. Indeed. All right. Um, and Mark, how about from your side? Yeah. I think sort of both ends of the spectrum is um, what I've had discussions about, Andre. Some have just said, look, cap capital project in general uh, will be postponed. Um, you know, and, and going back to some of the points earlier, I think Jeremy said, you know, you're, you've either got cash or you don't. And if you don't, then uh, you're probably not going to get too much and, and you're probably not going to want to spend too much either. But then you know, some see this time as an opportunity and, and, and you know, I, I reflect on a previous part of my life going through the, the global financial crisis where we invested perhaps more than we ever did through that phase to retool and, and come out of, um, you know, this, obviously not as extreme as this situation, but the slowdown of business, uh, better prepared for the future. Um, although, Going back to some of the other points too, I think just depending on guest sentiment coming out of this and, and what they expect as a traveller in the more immediate term is going to have some level of impact on where technology might shift uh, in terms of priority for, for industry in general. Yeah. Greg? Um, I think, I, you know, I, I think the... Um, the, the, the technology, like I said before, I think the technology impact will be interesting to see. I think it'll be um, hoteliers will have to react to what the guests are looking to what guests are looking for um, or what their what their requirements are. They won't have the cash to overinvest in those in those things um, as as they are. Um, fortunately, kind of like a new opening, um, the demand will probably be low. Um, actually, it'll probably be very high at the beginning and then wane out. It's kind of like a brand new restaurant opening where everybody wants to see it for the first two weeks and you think, wow, this is a great success. And then you find out in week three, four and five that they may not they may not be there. You may get the same thing because it'll be it'll be it'll be you know, you'll have to see are there are there reinfections? Are there are there are there more hot spots in the world? Will that stop everything again? Will it stop harder this time? And will they even be more cautious next time? Or God willing, everyone goes back to travel again, and it's 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 it, it, it doesn't happen, and everything is good, and and people start to meet again and start to have that. I mean, obviously, um, the. Um, I think like CRM technology will play big because you're going to see a lot of local travelers first and regional travelers that go with that. Business will probably come back first because um, they'll need they'll feel they'll feel the need to get out to their customers and to and to see uh, their customers. Meetings will come along slower if not any other reason. They have to plan for the meetings and and, and pick a date that they know they are. I mean, here in the U.S., we've had. Um, I've already seen a, co a couple of conferences that have scheduled and then they've already postponed again, um, moving um, back into the fourth quarter. But I can tell you right now, if everything holds the way it is, November and December are gonna be crazy months for uh, for meetings in this industry. It's, it, it's gonna be, uh, so that's, and you gotta be able to, you know, everything's gotta be able to support that and with what's going on and having the, you know, the funds to do that. Mm -hmm. Are you getting a sense in the US that Things will start to be back at back to normal by November. Is that is that a well, general consensus? Then? I mean, high tech is scheduled for October. Um, it looks like that's going to happen. Um, MPI's World Conference was moved to November. Um, HT Next, which is the HT and G conference, was just re moved from August, which is which was supposed to be last week, and has now been moved to uh, the first part of December. 
So yeah, you're starting to see a little bit. Now the interesting aspect is that I haven't seen anything from high tech yet, but HT Next and um, the MPI conference are are both um, implementing a virtual part to their conference. So it's kind of a backup plan where they both said that, hey, if we can't meet in person, um, the, um, we will still meet virtually. And that's a lot for the educational content that's associated with those conferences. Yeah, I was just going to, you know, I have a, I have a contact that's um, pretty connected in the in the global um, meetings industry, and um, the sentiment there is that that this year is largely sort of finished. Uh, even here in Las Vegas, speaking to some of the large venues, um, you know, everything cancelled between now and the end of the year. However. On the flip side, um, you know, and these are major events. I won't, I won't mention brands or names, but um, but then have rebooked in 21 for everything, and with a very extended window uh, going out five or seven years after that for reconfirming the events. Um, you know, I wonder as things as things slowly open back up, whether volume. Um, meetings might still be restricted for some time to come by government anyway yeah i think that's quite likely uh Mark, Charlotte, what are your thoughts i mean what i'm trying to get at is, that, is there a is there a general consensus from the the clients that you're talking to about a particular direction that they see that they're going to be moving towards or uh is there going to be a particular technology that they may be requiring to support them did you mention my name because you were just cut off? <laughs> Sorry, no, I said Charlotte. Ah, okay. But we will come to you afterwards, Michaela. I, I will have to be maybe controversial and say at the moment, mostly it's about survival. Yeah, no, be controversial. It's fine. I, I'm sorry. The, 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 there are, of course, an awful lot of extra stuff in all of the conversations. But everybody's watching their cash flow. Everybody's watching what the next directive is from the individual governments where they are. My clients are based all over the world. I have only one uh, one particular customer here in the UK. So it's very scattered. And I hear, of course, quite a lot of different things, but I also hear a lot of similarities uh, from across. It is about being able to service your customer as well as possible and keep as many staff uh, in place, occupied, uh, asking, uh, you know, it's much more for me, what I see and what I hear, it's much more practical right now. Give it another couple of months, you know, yes, we are looking at, at how to improve uh, on the products and on the service, We're looking at how to support the customers. Uh, but, but it's, it's uh, the, you know, it's, no, it's a third case. I think I, I, a, lot, I love uh, a lot of vendors certainly are, are very aware that this is a long, you know, we're in for the long, long run here. And I, going back on events, I think it's done this year. Yeah, I, I have a feeling with events, again, I can't talk for what's going on in the US, but I think you and Europe, in Europe can basically write this year off. Yeah, yeah. Michaela, please. Yeah, we're not going to have the support in Europe for that. No, no. Michaela. Yes, I think um, events is also particularly um, interesting for hotels to organize events on a legal side because um, there is a legal issue with the events space uh, at the moment being discussed in our industry where um, hotels could be reliable for guests becoming ill and um, insurance is not paying for that so you can't put an insurance on that. So the idea is to just rent the space to the people rather than providing any um, any meeting and uh, event services anymore. So I assume that this um, this part of our industry uh, we will see a big change here. Absolutely. All right, great. So let's move on then uh, in terms of uh, the technologies that are needed. Um, Kayla, you mentioned earlier before that you've already been working with your customers about ways that they can strengthen their direct sales. Um, what other, I guess, strong technologies and own direct sales is what you've mentioned here are needed in order to, to, to strengthen the confidence of guests in the recovery phase. But um, I mean, yes, it, that's, that's one element, but what are other aspects that you each feel 
are really going to be core components that's going to give that confidence back to the, the traveler that it's it's actually going to be okay to travel again. Um, you know, we spoke earlier when we had the, the hoteliers session that you know there's going to be an, an emphasis on the hygiene within within the hotel, and that perhaps there may be you know within um, the booking.com or within the the hotel's website a stamp of approval saying that they meet a certain hygiene requirement. Um, you know, where 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 do your clients see that there's going to be that extra requirement in terms to build that confidence again to the traveller? Jeremy, how about yourself? Well, I think, you know, obviously everybody's focused right now on, on you know, getting some kind of certification in place. And, and I know Hyatt's already moved uh, in the news uh, that I read. Um, they've already moved in that direction. But I think the other side of it is actually just implementing, you know, how are we going to implement it, right? And, you know, what does that mean in terms of, uh, you know, exacting that confidence out of, out of travelers, you know, um, to, to Greg's earlier point, I think a lot of the sentiment here is is that you'll start to see travel towards the the end of the year, and it'll be mainly domestic, and then you know eventually move into the international markets. But a lot of it depends on what happens with airlines, uh, a lot of local travel, etc. I think there is going to be a focus on cleanliness. I think there's going to be you know a lot of the larger brands are bringing out um, like you know the top ten areas within a guest room to clean. You're starting to see some new technology for cleaning. Um, and I think uh, the other side of it, though, is going to be, you know, the contactless uh, technology and being able to check in. And what are the rules and regulations? You're already starting to see, you know, in the media now, um, you know, thermal imaging cameras, et cetera, for both guests and staff. And so I think the more you can build around that program to just at least give people the comfort level that they, they are able to um, come to hotel, you know, you're, you know, initially everybody's reducing seating capacity in restaurants. You're starting to see, um, you know, rotation of rooms right now where, um, you know, guest rooms aren't being used for three or four days. And if the hotels have low occupancy, you can do that. But once things start to ramp up, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. But I think the big thing is a lot of people here in the U.S. from a sense, certainly, you know, where we are, um, are, are eager to get out again, eager to tr start, you know, moving things forward. And I think depending on where we are with regards to, a, a, um, you know, either a vaccine or some kind of solution, that's going to encourage people to sort of get out. But it's it's going to be a, a process, no question, to get that done. And, and, and I think, you know, it's certainly the, you know, focus on, on cleanliness is there and it's creating some kind of standard, at least comfort level, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, think the same, I think the same way you see restaurants today that have health inspections because of in the past where they were concerned about contaminate, being served contaminated food, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see um, hotels with ratings um, where they'll, they'll be inspected by, by, um, by, an agent, by a government agency on a non-announced basis where they'll, so in, that's the only way you're going to install in, uh, consumer co confidence because I don't know if the consumer's necessarily trust the brands um, to say that, hey, we've got this new cleaning protocol and we're going to do this. I think it's going to take someone to put a sticker on a window that says they've got an A, they got an A rating or an A, a plus rating for cleanliness and their meeting standards. And and that's I, I think that people are going to look for that. I mean, it wouldn't surprise that wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, they did it to restaurants years ago, right? Because people were getting sick when they went to bad restaurants. So the only way you could be sure that this that this hotel is clean is saying okay someone's put someone's put a stamp on there that they that they're following they're they're within regulations right now each each you know right now each each brand is coming out with their cleaning standards i don't think that's going to be the end all i think there'll be a industry standard for all hotels agreed how do you how do you feel that um companies like airbnb and sonder for example are going to uh, comply with those types of standards when they do come out, because ultimately I think they're going to be held to the same standards. They're going to have to be, um, and there has been some, uh, you know, talk on on LinkedIn. Many people feel that this might even be the the death knell for for companies like that. I personally don't think it is, but I will be very curious to see how they respond in terms to towards the the hygiene standards. Yeah, I, I um, think I think that. Um you know, going back to Greg's point and going back to the concept of a certification of cleaning, I think that, that, that 
if anything, probably the homestay companies are in a better position because, you know, if, if, you know my, my view is that, that anyone who's, who's smart will bring in a proper commercial grade cleaner and there'll be documentation to show that it's been done, um, you know, in terms of you know, who did the work and what they did, which I think is a little bit more difficult in a hotel. And, and going back to Greg's point about certification, you know, the Singapore government, um, I, mean, but I think maybe three weeks ago, came out with um, their standards for, you know, clean, cleaning uh, for Singapore hospitality. But I think the, the bigger question becomes, well, how do you, how are you going to verify that? I mean, is the Singapore government going to have someone in the hotel after each room gets cleaned with a seal of approval? No, they're not. So I think, you know, eventually, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said that in any decent standard of hotel we had a cleaning issue anyway. I think that it's just now much more topical because uh, the guest is focused on it, so we need to draw some focus to it. But, you know, I, I, once upon a time I used to run housekeeping and, and, you know, there's a lot of care and attention applied to the regimes and, and the types of chemicals and the hygiene standards in a hotel because we're expected to provide that, that standard, you know, as an industry. Absolutely. And I think we generally do, but I think it comes back to this, this consumer trust again. Charlotte, sorry, you wanted to yeah, say no, something? I, you know, I, I, I sort of did talk quite a lot that's been said, but I certainly think uh, <laughs> never ever underestimate the power of Airbnb as so many to the detriment, <laughs> you know, found out, particularly all the hoteliers. And I think there will be many, many travellers out there, you know, who've had a better experience of cleanliness at an Airbnb that they have had in some hotels. That's a fact. And so, you know, again, we need to have a rubber stamp on something. It goes back to the point uh, of, 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 of setting a standard and Airbnb will do the same. You know, these are clever people. They know they have to do that to keep attracting that huge, well, more people stay in an Airbnb than they stay anywhere else. So let's, let's start with that for a fact, for starters. So of course they're gonna work that out just as hotels are gonna to have to work it out. At the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. Once the borders, there's nowhere to go. We can't go anywhere. So this is an interesting conversation to be had in the first place. We can't go anywhere. If we could go somewhere, we would have to be quarantined for two weeks before going to the hotel. And where would we stay? So it's it's all it's all sort of so, it's, 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 it's all just very difficult to have the conversation right now because we don't know what the world would look like once we start to open, but we will have to have things certified in order to get that consumer trust back in. But I don't think an Airbnb is going to go under because of this. Maybe it would have to change certain things, but so will all the hotels. It's just yeah. hospitality will need to look very, very carefully at, at, at what they offer, you know. Air, the, Air Airbnb will issue standards and they already have. I mean, I have I have a home that's under that I sell on Airbnb and they they told me how to clean my house. Um, would you rather go to an Airbnb than a hotel if you want to social distance? I mean, I mean, it's, it's it, it could be safer and I, I can bring my my Lysol and my wipes and wipe down whatever I have to to have at that have at that house. Anyway, Airbnb will, will be just will be just fine. They'll probably have an easier time getting consumers consumer trust and staying somewhere than some of the other hotels. I mean, because, I mean, we used to, when, before this, you used to check, I used to grade hotels by saying, is the room clean? Do they have great Wi-Fi? And there's a, is there good pressure in the shower? Those are primarily my, my requirements on whether I stayed or went back to a hotel again. If it was dirty, I'm not gonna go back. If the Wi-Fi was bad, I'm not gonna go back. And if, there, if it was a horrible shower, I'm not, those are the, my, my things. So. It, it's not a real stretch for me to for me to travel to, for me to travel again in the room. I'm, I'd be more concerned about the people around me than, than actually in the room itself. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with with all that has been said, and I think that coming back to the hotels discussion, um, I mean the mega chains do that already, but we need to um, educate our industry to um, uh, in, insist more on loyalty and what comes with uh, loyalty programs. I mean they don't necessarily need to be points based, of course, um, uh, benefit based or whatever. But um, I think our industry, um, when we did this CRM study last year. We found out that uh, hotel chains do not really personalize um, uh, communications uh, with the guests, 
And that's something that is very important now in order to build trust and confidence and in, in order to prove that, for instance, hygiene standards are being met. So I think loyalty will, will, be, will, be, will become very different. Absolutely. And I think that's where, again, the given the, the focus that the major chains put on their loyalty programs may also actually do quite well from. So, okay, great. Okay. Look, last question moving into today's session. Uh, we've spoken about getting the, the consumer's confidence, but how, how about the actual employee's confidence? So when, when things do start to ramp up again and people start to want to go back to work or go back to work, what new way of working is going to be necessary to increase the employee confidence and how can companies best support uh, their employees during that process? Because of course, it's not just about the guests coming to the hotels, but also the, 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 the staff that work there, um, as well as the tech, tech providers who have staff go on site. So there's a responsibility really from the employee's perspective. So uh, how do you see that working out? What type of um, uh, measures will be put in place around that? Well, it's funny, yeah. there's, a, there's a restaurant here in Orlando that was making a, um, a big deal that he was, they were reopening um, their restaurant under, under government guidelines. And he was complaining he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't get his employees to come back to work. Um, in some cases, um, they're making more off of unemployment than they're making in, in their wages there it, with the with the reduced crowds um, coming back. So it's, it's, it's a big you have to earn the employees trust that you're that you're going to be able to protect them while they're there. Again, I think it's something that's going to fade over time. And as we um, as, as we as we um, especially actually, especially in a post vaccine area. Um, but. It's, it, it's, it, you have to, and, and the one, and the, and the companies that have furloughed their employees and, and not communicated to them um, during this time, they're going to, they're going to lose some loyalty and they're going to have to um, have an HR aspect to this that they didn't realize um, when they went into it. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah. It's, it's particularly, I think there's also, sorry, so, sorry, I, I think there's also the aspect of, you know, showing them just what you're trying to do from the guest perspective but also doing it from the employee's perspective, right? So in terms of any kind of, you know, I mentioned thermal imaging for, 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 for staff, et cetera, and, and creating an environment for them that actually, you know, is safe and where they feel like they can come to work and, and not be exposed, so to speak. And, and you are starting to see this play out with regards to all of the provision that's going on right now. There are hotels that are open right now that are dealing with this and having to actually, you know, work through all of these issues, right? And so um, I, I think it's gonna be a very similar approach. And to Greg's point, you know, I know certainly, certainly from our client standpoint, they targeting key key resources. So, you know, it's, it's they're gonna to wanna to make sure that those resources are comfortable with their working environment and with what's going on. And in some cases, it's gonna mean some big changes with regards to how hotels uh, do, do business. Hmm. So for sure, it's uh, you know if you want the top echelon of of, of staff, etc., you're going to need to make sure that you have things in place. And then there's the whole legality of it, right? So we haven't even started here with regards to the potential lawsuits of what's going to come down from all of this. And I think you know the the point's well taken that you know we've gonna we're going to be looking at it from a number of different vantage points. One of them is going to be legal. One of them is going to be you know what do we need to do for our staff. Yeah, it's an excellent point, Jeremy. Here in Las Vegas, yeah. um, you know, the major, the major unions that represent a lot of the staff on Las Vegas Boulevard are in exactly that, that circumstance. They're saying, well, we're not, we're not ready to come back to work yet because we're not comfortable about the environment and the safety associated with being at work. And of course, Las Vegas being a city that is entirely visitor driven, um, we've done quite a good job with uh, maintaining you know, a good status with, with the coronavirus in general, but that's purely because we've stopped travel essentially. Um, you know, our, our population in Las Vegas basically assembles on the strip to, to look after visiting people. And of course, you know, going back to some of the things that have come out even with CES as far back as January, um, you know, the volumes that we get here mean that it's very difficult to control uh you know i'm not quite sure how you check the temperature of thousands and thousands of people coming into a casino property yeah. for whatever the reason is with multiple 
access points, but you know, naturally the staff are concerned and it's a matter on, on the table for union negotiation at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah, and... Michaela, please. Um, yeah, and, and I think lots of employees have suffered from the crisis, um, being it due to unpaid leave or Kurzarbeit in Germany, as we call it. So fear comes on top to completely lose their jobs. And um, we can only imagine what this does to the mindset of the society. And that's not only in our industry, it's across all industries, of course. So I think what we need is tactics to increase confidence and trust. And, um, it, and companies must build up uh, more equity capital to stabilize their business. Because in the past, we have seen um, the speed of expansion versus uh, more time for quality. I think that's something that we really need to look at. Hotel concepts with the environment in mind uh, will definitely grow as their strategies will create a very different commitment for employees. So this is at least what we see here in, uh, in Europe. And this is the best time to start creating sustainable concepts also in harmony with the nature. So uh, I think hotels can do a great job here. And that, I think that's also to me very important. Yes, it's a very good point, Michaela. In fact, that's actually a, a bit of an underlying theme that's been mentioned in all of these sessions. That uh, So I think that that's de definitely something to consider. Okay, before we wrap this up, I'd like to just uh, comment or make so, give some feedback in terms of the comments that we've received. There's a question and there's a comment. So I'll start with uh, the question, uh, and it's from David Chesler. David's asking, what happens if within one year there actually is a vaccine, uh, treatments and similar? Does this change our planned solutions that we're actually seeking now? It's a good question. That's a great question. Jeremy, what do you think? I think, uh, you know, I think to some extent it's going to, you know, but I don't think that we're going to go back and reset completely to where we were. You know, there's definitely something that's coming out of this. There's a no, no return. I mean, I even equate it down to the way we're doing business, right? You know, if you take a look at it, and I'm going to digress here, if you take a look at a lot of the commercial real estate right now where you have offices, et cetera, we're already hearing from people that I know within the commercial uh, real estate business that um, there's a percentage of staff that will not return back to the office. There's a percentage of staff that may not travel. We've gotten so used to communicating on on, on uh, these, these platforms now that it's going to change the dynamics of what we do and how we encourage people to, to travel, right? And so I think to some extent, I do see a resetting because I think once everybody feels comfortable that the fact that they're not going to, you know, the, the, the impact of this virus is going to be minimized, that's one thing. But I don't think it's going to change some of the parameters with what we're dealing with and how, what we've all done. And, and it's worldwide. That's the other thing that I think is important to understand. It's not localized to, you know, one country or whatever else. Like everybody else on this call, I'm in touch with people across the world and across the glo globe, and, and I'm seeing the exact same thing there. And we've gone through this for too long now for it to reset completely. But I don't think, to Greg's point, that it's going to be something that prevents us from doing things going down in, in the future. I mean, people have been cooped up for X amount of time right now, and they're already going crazy, right? So um, yeah. I, I think it's kind of a, going to be a mix. Yeah. I would um, I would concur on that, and I and um, I I think the 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 fact is that when we do come out, say this scenario, David, it's a great question. <laughs> and when if we do come out in a year's time and there's a vaccine, we're still this has still been a year, and that will have done such a lot to all of us on so many 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 levels, including Jeremy's point, Greg's point earlier on, particularly the homework, and we've been talking about you know creating a work life balance for twenty years. Hallelujah, you know, if it took a pandemic to realize that we can do so much stuff this way, actually better and more effectively than using all of our time and efforts, you know, to commute backwards and forwards into offices, there is a real opportunity to actually truly, truly understand how we can still be very, very productive professionally, but also have a, have a, have a, have a good private life and have time enough to recuperate and be, you know, the best we can possibly be. So we are all going to have to hopefully learn something from this. People, I think somebody else has said this before me, people do have short memories. So I would love for this, I would love for sustainability to be at the forefront. I would love for us to, to start to travel more carefully. I mean, just because you can fly to, 
return flight from England to Poland, some unpronounceable city in Poland, and just to drink cheap beer for the sake of just doing it. I think I heard this somebody else saying, but it's very true. Why would you do it? What is the point of that? You know, what is the what is the offset? But if that's but well, who am I to preach? If that's what somebody wants to do, because the airline ticket is cheap and the beer is available then that's the way that we are kind of beginning to, we've been doing this for a very, very long time. Now the earth is breathing a little more easily if we want to touch on some green stuff, but I'm enjoying that. And I have also realized that everybody else, I miss seeing my, my friends and colleagues in the industry and I miss being with them, but this is also a, a way of communicating and we can, we can certainly save what we could save us. We are more available to one another because we're not always flying off on a business trip, quite frankly, and I've heard this being said again and again and again. Greg mentioned it very early on. He can actually get hold of people. Well, that's a nice thing for starters. So there is a lot in here, and I think that that's all part of the reset, and hopefully some of it will stick because we can do things better than we have done before yeah. this horrendous pandemic arrived. Yeah, absolutely. And a follow-up comment to, to David's question from Daniel Zelling um, is basically saying, uh, confirming, yes, that's a great question. And his hope, he says his hope would be that a good part of the industry evolved from just selling beds and meeting rooms to maybe broader levels with a better diversification and that there won't be a reason to go back to the older models. So I think everyone has that kind of sense of, yeah, this is an opportunity to change. He does say, go on to say that perhaps that won't be possible for 100% of the hotels and not in all locations. That's a fair point. Let's see what will happen to the ones that are not that flexible. And he also mentions that perhaps governments need to help them out or will they just simply disappear? So as everyone says at the moment, I guess no one really knows. All right. One other question. This is great. We're getting some great feedback here from some people now. Um, question from Metin Sportman, who is the head of sales at Meeting Point Hotels in Turkey. His question is, uh, what do you think of merging or applying new reassurance programs or funds for the insurance companies that will support and initiate the governments to set up new data protection and management policies? As we mine end users data, not necessarily in tourism industry only, but utilizing efficient travel tech CRM channels to integrate their loyalty programs and form global alliances with other market providers. What do you think about that? Michaela, you spoke about loyalty earlier. Perhaps would you like to address that one? So it was a large, <laughs> large question. <laughs> um, so I, I got half of it, I think. Um, so would you like me to repeat the, the last part? Yes, please. So he's asking, as we mine end users' data, not necessarily in tourism industry, but by utilizing efficient travel technology, CRM channels, to integrate their loyalty programs and form global alliances with other market providers. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, that question was coming from Turkey, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. So I think we have very, and, and I think he was also talking about the government and um, dealing with the insurance companies. Right. So I think this is a very local, um, local aspect where, um, because we know that in Germany we have very different laws than in the UK, for instance. And, um, and then when it comes to Turkey, um, it, it might be totally different. But I think that that has been exactly discussed here in, uh, in a session in, in Germany recently. And I think that's a great idea um, and um, should be looked at. But um, uh, across borders will be difficult. Mm. Okay. We have another comment from Eric Rogers who's head of uh, EMI sales for and global accounts at Nevertech. And it's just a comment, it's not a, a question at all, but I think it's an interesting one. Some hotels actually terminated their staff and turfed them out as soon as the lockdown started. Frankly, I think they will suffer with finding loyal staff going forward. Mark, I see you nodding your head there. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's happened here in a major, major way. And you've got, you've got two, two ends of the street, basically, some of, uh, basically gotten rid of everyone um, even as even as soon as days after the after the the lockdowns began and, and maybe even before in some cases and it's continued on and then you've got some who have some um, looked after their staff so it's going to be very interesting uh, just reading some of the sentiment around town about attitudes both from the guest 
and the staff about what happens post-crisis. Right, right. I don't know about here. Have you seen that, Charlotte and Michaela, in Europe? Have we seen any of that? I'm not aware of that in Europe. Uh, no, no, not not to the same extent I would expect like it to, 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 for example, in America. But, you know, again, just back to the point that, you know, people have long memories. So, <laughs> so that staff, you know, when there will be some openings, uh, they are hopefully not going to go back to those types of companies. Uh, again, this boils down to communication. And I think everybody, and we see stories certainly across Europe, everybody can understand the severity of the situation, but where managements have kept very, very strong communication going internally, and when they have stated in grand terms that we're all in it together, they really truly were in it together. They either put their own salaries on hold for the first quarter, or uh, they have also taken a week's holiday, they have asked people to go down part-time, they have themselves actually led by example. I see a lot of loyalty from the employers of those types of companies. And I right. say I'm happy to work with a few that behave like that. Um, yeah. it, it, will come, it will come back to, uh, to roost. I think yeah. well, like I, I agree with Charlotte and I've seen that as well, but I've also seen other. So I've also seen what Mark pointed out and um, very sad. And as, yeah, I, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, I think we need to look more for quality than uh, expanding into markets and spending money uh, everywhere, uh, not, but not for maybe uh, employees who um, are really uh, well, well building. building. Yeah. yeah. Well, we also, we also don't have the employer, the employment contracts in the US like they do in, in Europe. Yeah. So. Sure they can you know it's it's at it's 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 labor at will um that it's which, which i think is a, is a big has a big difference on the two you know the thing i'm on a separate note though, the thing i'm, I'm that, that's going to be interesting to see is that first person that is denied boarding on an air on an air on an airplane because he has a fever and it doesn't go into a crm on his record so when three weeks later when he tries to get on a plane he's denied boarding again or does someone sue a hotel because he has a fever and they won't let him stay there. And it's not because of COVID, it's because he has strep throat or he has an infected finger that's doing that. So, and then where did all the privacy go? I mean, they're talking about all these things going on. What happened to GDPR and what happened to the California? I mean, that's a whole piece we haven't even started to look at yet where they're saying, we wanna be able to take everyone's temperature as they walk in. I mean, I remember flying into, into parts of Asia where I walked through a thermal scan, walked by a thermal scanner, and they they showed it. And if you showed up bright pink, they pulled you out of line to find out what was going on with you. And a lot mm -hmm. of times, well, I've been in Asia for a week. I mean, who doesn't have a fever from that you've been traveling there? That you, that you've been with what you've been doing. So, uh, but it it's going to happen. happen. That's a whole different thing. It's going to happen as we start to come back. These people that that are, I think, overreacting sometimes. But I understand. But I understand it's an understandable overreaction. But the first time I say. I say, Mark, you can't stay at my hotel because you have a fever and you turn around and hit me with a, with a lawsuit for discrimination or you, you won't let me walk into a casino or I sat at a casino playing blackjack and I can prove the guy next to me coughed on me and got me sick. And I say, you're not allowed to be there. That's a whole new can of worms that's going to be opened up that until they get until they get their hands around that, it's going to it, it'll, that'll be another piece that will slow the recovery. Yeah, I think you're right, Craig. And I think perhaps you might even be getting ahead of everything a little bit by saying what you're saying. But with that said, it's definitely worth considering now because you're right, GDPR has to be considered. Um, and there's a lot of talk at the moment uh, about people having to download this this COVID-19 app onto right. your smartphone that, that validates that you are COVID-19 free. Now, what happens if for some reason or not, you personally don't want to download that app because you want your privacy secured. Is, are they are they going to single you out and say, well, hey, without that app, buddy, you ain't moving anywhere. So well, well, it's, well, it's going to be an interesting are, dynamic. That they are because, um, you know, a couple of airports already in the world have started to charge for sort of somewhat as close as you can get to on the spot tests. And if yeah. you don't take the test, you're in quarantine for two weeks. And yeah. going back to Greg's point, um, you know, I think the data side of this is, is going to become very important because there's yeah. every country with every system and 
you know, if you're going to let someone into your hotel wherever it is in the room, in the world, temperature is not enough. You know, I, I actually had coronavirus, and I didn't really run a temperature, maybe mm. for one day, and then after mm. that, no problem. So that is not that's not going to pick it up. There's going to be something. There's going to have to be something far more stringent and much more shareable across, you know, any public facing business to address this. Yeah, and, and the other side of this is that you know. I, you, you, the the results of all of this are only as good as your last test, right? And oh, so, what does that exactly mean, right? And 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 I think oh. that's where coming back to this whole legal aspect and how you approach this, this is what's going to become so important about how you respond to all of this. It's not a question yeah. about just making your hotels clean. It's about doing the right thing and thinking everything through, oh. as opposed to just having a knee jerk reaction that actually says, okay, look, you know, we're going to do this because we heard it over here or because these guys are doing that. You really need to think this thing through because I think this is where we're going to have a lot of problems coming forward. Yeah, agreed. All right, guys, there's two more two more points I'd like to cover because we're getting some uh, great feedback here. And there's one here from a very old friend of mine from, from my Asian days, Mr. Sri Hash Bandari. Sri, wonderful to know that you're tuning in, my friend. Great to, great to see your comment here. He basically confirms that contactless service will be the new normal, considering that this will be uh, what we need that many service staff uh, that we used to have in the past. So definitely contactless as well. And also another uh, old friend of mine, Olaf Slater, um, has also perhaps left a question in relation to sustainability. He says that there has recently been a growth of adoption in retail for sustainability proven products, example, organic eggs, that are even more expensive, but showcase an eco balance score on the package. Have we started to see more acceptance in the hotels for partaking in similar benchmarks and making that information available to consumers? Example, in the di direct distribution channel. So again, I think that's, uh, that's a good question. And I, I think, Olaf, yes, we will start to see that type of thing. I don't know if others on the, on the session agree with me, but I, I think we will. Yes, I agree. And um, final question, I think, from uh, Dr. Zelling. If allowed, be then, would anyone status quo today consider going to a trade show such as WTM London at all? My guess is they all will be cancelled in the end, but how to plan ahead right now? I think, Daniel, the reality is um, plan for 2021. Yeah. That would be my response. Okay, guys, I, we've gone for 90 minutes. Uh, it's been wonderful having you on this session. Uh, thank you all so much for, for taking the time and making yourselves available. We, we really do appreciate it. As with our previous sessions, this is, uh, the recording will be made available on our website, and we'll also be doing a, a summary uh, as well that will be available for download on our website and posted as well. So um, for, for those watching and listening, if you haven't already and you're interested to see from the previous sessions, the feedback and the comments that we got, please do visit our website. You'll you go to the collective sessions. You'll see all of that data there. Um, and I'm hoping that it will provide some assistance for, for you, no matter on what side of the spectrum you may be positioned on, whether you're the hotelier, the hotel owner, the hotel company, the consultant, the vendor, possibly even the student who's wondering, what are we going to do with our careers moving forward? Um, which moving into the next session is our actual uh, next collective session, which is all about next gen. That's coming up this Friday. So make sure that you tune in for that one as well, because we've got some great people coming on from, uh, from some local hotel schools here in Switzerland. Okay, guys, thank you all so much. Thank it's you. been a great pleasure having you here. You. We do appreciate it. And uh, until next time, <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks, Bye. 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 Bye.